What if everyone could code? What if they already can? I'm Ray Myers. Welcome to Craft vs. Cruft. Now, I often hear questions like this. What if machines could do the mechanical parts of what humans do? Well, often they do. We call that automation. Automation of the software variety is often called programming. But what if the mechanical parts of programming were automated? We do that. Constantly. In fact, we're, we're positively neurotic about finding new ways to eliminate duplicate work. Well, what if you could draw upon a vast library of code already written? Yeah, we call those library dependencies. What if you could skip the code entirely and just describe in unambiguous terms what you wanted the computer to do? Well, then you would have a programming language. They, they exist to describe in human-readable and unambiguous terms what you want a computer to do. No, but it would be like a higher-level pass that generates code. Yes, we, we do that. For instance, in DSLs, domain-specific languages, and in multi-pass compilers. Uh, for instance, the GHC Haskell compiler uses at least four intermediate representations, not including the Haskell code itself or the assembly or machine language. Do you really think that it's impossible to make further progress? Well, of course not. That's why we continue to refine our tool chains and new language communities are still forming with new approaches. Just understand that we've seen claims of revolutions in coding, productivity, or even elimination coupled with impressive demos regularly for over 50 years. The ideas that actually made a dent were few and far between, and even then, the realistic implications were different than uh, we would have expected. So, what have you got? Well, this time what they've got are large language models like GPT-4 in France. And it's quite impressive. And I want to respond to a lot of the sentiment that I'm seeing right now. For instance, in this uh, Guardian article here, Programmers Beware, ChatGPT Has Ruined Your Magic Trick, uh, subtitled Missile Aimed at Software Production, with a question mark following the law of headlines. Now, I hear people say this is going to democratize writing code, and I have a pretty hot take here. We already democratized writing code. Excel did it and JavaScript did it, and Python did it, and Pascal and probably even Basic did it. I started on a PC Junior. I, I could code when I was 12. Not very well, not like a software engineer, but all the people who think they'd never be able to code, the amount of coding they think they'd never be able to do, I did when I was 12. And you just have to take my word for it. I was not actually that smart when I was 12. I was a bright kid, but not a prodigy, you're absolutely more capable in every meaningful way than the 12-year-old me. I guarantee it. Uh, what I do now is very hard, but to slap a couple hundred lines together that do one interesting thing that you couldn't do before, it's not that hard. It's on the level with junior high algebra, if that. If you can read and write, you can code. You just maybe haven't yet. I know you look at the symbols and they look like Greek, but anyone can learn Greek too. They have classes. And if something new comes along that makes some useful subset of programming more accessible, we should welcome that. That's exactly what we've been trying to do this whole time. Let me show you something. This is Reball, which first appeared in 1997. You probably have never heard of it. Its goal was to simplify programming. It's got a very minimal syntax, and allows the creation of, of inner DSLs, those domain-specific languages I mentioned. On their website, you can see some pretty impressive examples of its power. They have uh, one line, for instance, that can take a URL for a web page, parse the HTML, and print all the links. There's a calculator app with a GUI and 40 lines, Tetris and a few hundred. Uh, not code golfing, just perfectly readable code as you'd write it. And uh, at the time, that level of expressivity was pretty amazing. It didn't pan out, I guess, and they're still working on it. There's an offshoot called Red, um, but I don't see much much traction in the, in the larger programming communities. A simple Lisp dialect called Scheme came out in 1975, and I don't know if we've truly seen a better language since honestly. Uh, it has many descendants. The closest might be Racket. The uh, visual programming language Scratch came out in 2002 from MIT. Still seems to be active and viable as a teaching language. 
uh, influences the, to that include agent sheets from 1991 and hypercard from 1987. I remember uh, on Lego Mindstorms before Scratch came out doing something very similar, probably had similar influences. The interactive fiction community still exists in the tradition of 80s Infocom games like Zork and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Modern interactive novelists often write their works in a language called Inform 7. I've read and even written some programs in Inform. And it's, it's a trip because they are surprisingly elaborate behaviors that are expressed in what looks like English, but it's, it's a restricted subset of English that it takes a while to get the hang of to understand which constructs you can and, and can't use. Now, those are just a few of the relatively successful attempts to simplify programming, and there are hundreds of experiments. You could spend days learning about them, and it's fascinating. In a very limited domain, like a teaching language or interactive novels, it is very tractable to create something simple yet powerful enough. But when you try to make it general purpose, like a foundation you can really build on, somehow the complexity always creeps back in. And even with the LLMs, we can already see it happening. Uh, since LLMs are good at taking plain language input, but limited in other ways, we think we can just give them tools, like library modules, and that will solve everything. Okay. So you'll just make everything important available behind a simple API. That makes everything easy, right? Just have a highly accessible syntax and batteries included. Does, does this sound familiar? Does this sound like something we've tried before? I mean, not to mention even the accessible part of this has prompt engineering involved uh, if you want to do it well. Now, my favorite resource on this is a website called Learn Prompting, and you should check it out. Even the first few lessons will level up your use of things like ChatGPT. But if you read the whole thing, it's 40,000 words. That's a short book. Would it really be that much harder to pick up a copy of The Little Schemer or get on Chelsea Troy's Python course? I'm not encouraging one or the other. I think programming and AI prompting are both things to get a taste of and probably both here to stay. Um, but if you, you studied language design and, and grammars and library ecosystems and all that stuff, you know that simple looks easy, but simple is hard, especially simplicity that will stand the test of time and adoption and evolution. We keep thinking this time it'll be different. And it's like an eternal riddle. We just can't crack. I close my eyes and I can see it, but when I open them, it's gone. So we can keep trying and we should keep trying because even if we never get there, where we get will be better than if we didn't try. And good luck. Here's to simplicity, not naive simplicity, but a well thought, robust, sustainable simplicity. And as Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching, I have just three things to teach. Simplicity, patience, compassion. Those three are your greatest treasures. And he also said, with patience, the most tangled cord may be undone. Thank you.